This is the second of a two-part series videos on the Arab Spring and the implications for what's happening today in the West and the United States. In the first video on the Arab Spring, I argued that the effort failed, that the Arab Spring was incapable of delivering a secular society to the Arab world. Because before you can have that, you have to secularize the disciplines which form the foundation, the pillars of that society. That took centuries to develop in the West. It hadn't happened, still hasn't happened in the Islamic world or the Arab world. And that's why the effort was doomed to failure, in my view. And 10 years later, it was. If you look around the Arab world today, things are worse. You know, Libya is a disaster. Syria is a disaster. Lebanon's a disaster. Yemen's a disaster. Iraq's a mess. Now, there are plenty of other causes for that. But certainly, the Arab Spring did not deliver. And if you look around the Arab world today, you can see that that's true. But what are the implications for the West? And again, I'm not talking about foreign policy, terrorism, anything like that. I'm talking about what we're doing to ourselves today. Because if you accept that argument that the society that we live in, our, our secular society, the American Republic, specifically for the United States, rests on secularized disciplines, science, history, literature, and everything else. Are we strengthening those disciplines today? Or are we destroying them? What I thought I'd do, I want to read a passage from a book by Bernowski and Majlik, which is, was published in uh, 1960, I think, which I think epitomizes what I'm talking about here with regard to secularism of a society and also of the disciplines. The evidence of history is strong that those societies are most creative and progressive, which safeguard the expression of new ideas. Societies appear to remain vigorous only so long as they are organized to receive novel and unexpected and sometimes unpleasant thoughts. Galileo, arguing that we were in a heliocentric rather than a geocentric system was, for the powers that be at the time, an unpleasant thought. That's the scientific approach. Hypothesis, you test your hypothesis, you see if you can repeat the experiment. What's happening in the disciplines today is the reverse of that. You can't introduce unpleasant thoughts. You can't challenge the commonly held wisdom of the day. You know, if in Galileo's time, if you were teaching science and you said that the, you know, Earth revolved around the sun, you lose your job. You might lose your life. You might be tortured before you lose your life. If you work in a university today and you don't buy into Black Lives Matter or you don't buy into diversity arguments or you don't buy into climate change, you're going to lose your job. I mean, you cannot get hired today in a science department, I doubt very much you could survive and get hired if you did not accept the belief structure of, of climate change and everything that that implies. If you don't buy that, you're not going to get a job. If you've got a job, you won't get grant funding. I had a professor when I was an undergraduate in geology who was doing his work on a blitz ice age, which might hit us. He believed we were headed for an ice age, which was quite common back in the 60s and 70s in the scientific community. That was the big fear. I ran into him a few years ago, and now he's uh, you know climate change guy. 
And I even said to him, what, hap what happened to the Blitz Ice Age? Because I remembered. I remembered him. I remembered what he was working on. And he said, you know, you go where the grant dollars are. That's, that's basically where we're at today. You can't hold a view that goes against what's the perceived progressive norm of the period. We're going back to where we were when we lived in a theocratic society, where the disciplines are not free to think outside the box, where you get shut down. You get driven out. We see teachers and professors, even, even tenured professors, lose their jobs because they believe things or they, they, they propose ideas that go against the conventional wisdom. We're back to theocracy. Now, to be sure, the theocracy isn't theocratic in the sense of God, but it's a theocracy nonetheless. It's a belief structure, a progressive belief structure that you must adhere to in all instances, in all cases, or else you're going to get silenced. We're not at the point where we torture people and execute people who dissent, not yet at least, but we're going down that path. You can lose your job. You can get pushed aside. You can get yourself in trouble. You'll have to be accused of racism. You'll be accused of, of whatever. I was. I know what it's like. I know how it happens. Usually by, by people who really don't even know what they're talking about. But then you got to fend off the accusations anyway. And it's, it's just getting destructive. And you have to think the way they think. We're heading back away from where we were. If you look at the willingness of people within the disciplines to start thinking outside the box, which used to be thinking, you know, left politics. I mean, I can remember back when, when I started in college, it was the left that was all for free speech. You know, it was the left that in North Carolina didn't like that the universities were having these loyalty tests, you know, where you, you were a communist, you wouldn't, you can get hired or you might lose your job. Today, it's the other way around. It's the left that wants to clamp down on free speech. They want less free speech. The university where I taught over the summer, the leadership of the faculty senate said that our university, East Carolina University in Greenville, North Carolina, has, to, has been paying too much attention to the First Amendment. It's the First Amendment for a reason. How do you pay too much attention to it? And we, I know you know what they're getting at. What they want is hate speech protection, which, of course, is not part of the Constitution. I mean, the whole point of freedom of speech is to say things that people don't want to hear. If everybody, you only could say things that people want to hear, you don't need freedom of speech. If BLM is the greatest social movement in the history of mankind, and you say that, you don't need freedom of speech to say that. You need freedom of speech to say that it isn't. And there's just a case recently I saw of a, it was a school a teacher, a special ed teacher in Pennsylvania, somewhere around, in or, in or around Philadelphia, I don't know, it was Philadelphia district or just outside the city. She didn't even go the all lives matter route. She just said, black lives matter or which black lives? What about aborted black babies? What about black cops who get shot down? You know, blacks who get shot in the inner city by other blacks. She lost her job. So much for free speech. So much for freedom within the disciplines of a secular society. So as we break down the freedoms, the ability to think, the ability to question, in the disciplines, in history, economics, the sciences, social studies writ large, if you eliminate freedoms, the freedoms within those disciplines, you'll ultimately undermine the society itself. You know, it's like, like that game Jenga where you have little, little you know, blocks of wood and they're all piled up and you keep pulling them out. 
And you can pull out quite a few of them if you got a steady hand. But sooner or later, somebody pulls one out and the whole thing collapses. And that's what we're doing in our society. We're pulling out those little pieces of wood which undermine the disciplines. And ultimately, at some point, the whole thing's going to topple down. It's not a question of if. Jenga, the tower, always collapses. It's a question of when and who pulls out the final block that dooms the whole edifice. That's where we're at. We're headed toward replicating the Arab societies that were unable to achieve a secular society. We're destroying the foundations of our own society. And we see it every day. We see it in news stories here and news stories there. As freedoms get limited. And the most important freedom is the freedom to question, the freedom to have a different idea. Look at YouTube, look at Facebook, look at Twitter. What happens if you have a different idea, a different interpretation about what, why Joe Biden won the presidency? Gone. It's gone. The Chinese woman who posted the video that Tucker played a few, I guess it was two weeks ago, it was a, this was a video of a, a Chinese professor with Communist Party ties, high, or high up in the hierarchy, big player, comes over to the U.S. back and forth, saying things about how the Chinese have friends in Wall Street and in, the, in political circles. I was watching that. I, I saw it on Tucker, and I went and I found her channel, and I subscribed to her channel on YouTube. And I, I watched the whole video, because Tucker only played excerpts from it. And then she posted a video about, about uh, you know, how she had gotten hold of it. And then she posted a follow-up video. But I was in a rush. I didn't have time to watch it. So I made a mental note of it. And the next day I came back to view it. And it was gone. It was taken down. And then I went you know, over. I was watching my television. I moved over to where the other video had been. And that was gone too. They took that one down. And then she posted a new video saying that they had taken it down on a given date. And the same day that they took it down on YouTube, removed her videos on YouTube, was the same day that in China, the Communist Party had taken down all evidence of his talk. Any site, website in China that carried his talk, they were all cleared out. It was all taken down. And then I went to my Facebook postings because I had reposted her video on Facebook. My post was gone. I knew the date. And I went and I looked and there's a, it's not there in the sequence. I was never notified by Facebook. Usually Facebook, if they take something down or they block it or they put a warning on it, they send me a little notification. I didn't get anything. It just disappeared on my Facebook post. And all this happened in a 24 hour period. That's what's happening in this country. We're headed back to feudalism, which is, is basically in many ways how the Islamic world works. We're destroying centuries of Western intellectual development. Let me repeat that. We are in the process of destroying centuries of intellectual development in the West. And we're watching it happen. And when you pull out that last block, the edifice collapses, we're back to feudalism. And I think that's the lesson of a failure of the Arab Spring. We are replicating in our own society the conditions that caused the Arab Spring to fail. And if you look at the Arab world today, what do you see? Not what we hoped we would see 10 years ago coming out of it, a, a new, fresh, secular Arab world. We see Libya, civil war. We see Yemen, civil war. 
We see Syria, civil war. We see troubles in Iraq, not quite civil war. Lebanon falling apart. The Arab world is worse 10 years later. And the reasons that it's worse are reasons we are inflicting upon ourselves today. And to me, that's just incredible. That's why I keep posting videos that, you know, we're on a road toward a civil war. And if we don't slow down, at least, or preferably exit, and try a different route, we're going to end up like Libya or Yemen or Syria. Hopefully you got something out of these videos. If you did, give it a thumbs up. Uh, subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification button so you know when I post new videos. Share the video with your friends. really appreciate that. And until the next time, keep fighting.